Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all to this special seminar from the Middle East Institute here in Singapore. Well, this is a bit of an unusual event. We called it among ourselves a double header uh, because we have decided uh, to tackle two of the major political issues that are affecting our reach of the broader Middle East uh, today. Now I know that uh, in Singapore, I know that in Singapore, uh, many people think that uh, the Middle East is synonymous just with the Gulf, with the states of the Gulf, uh, Iran on one side and six Arab monarchies on the other. Uh, but there is uh, a larger Middle East, and what we're going to be talking about this afternoon in this extended session, this double seminar, uh, are the political crises that are facing two of the largest countries in the region, Egypt and Sudan. Between the two of them, they account for about 120 million people. So there's a, there's a larger Middle East out there, and I think it's important that uh, we try to understand what's going on. In political science, and those of us that do comparative politics in the Middle East, there's been an ongoing debate about the question of state failure in the region. And a related, but not identical question, is the question of regime legitimacy. In these two very large countries situated at the nexus of, of, of the uh, African Arab world and the Mashrik, the Asian Arab world, the larger Middle East, we have uh, two states that are possibly facing one or the other of these conditions. And what we're going to do uh, is hear first from our very eminent uh, political scientists from Egypt about the question of succession to the leadership, the presidential leadership in e Egypt following the recent uh, parliamentary elections. And I think, as a fellow political scientist, that what I will be looking for from uh, Dr. Mustafa Kamal Sayed's uh, remarks uh, is some insight into the question of regime legitimacy in Egypt. Uh, to what extent uh, does the very long tenure of uh, President Mubarak and the political and security apparatus surrounding him, to what extent is this uh, structure uh, still minimally credible and legitimate for the uh, Egyptian people? Certainly the recent parliamentary election results would indicate at face value, yes, of course, because the ruling party won very decisively. But I don't think there are many analysts of Egypt who feel that that's the end of the story by any means. So we're going to hear uh, in, in the largest of the Arab countries uh, discussion of whether uh, the regime the system of government of that immense and historically very bureaucratic state uh, is uh, still uh, minimally uh, credible and legitimate. And then we're going to turn to our second speaker, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Abushok, who will be uh, addressing the crisis facing the largest, territorially, the largest country in Africa, Sudan. And uh, I am hoping, again, as a political scientist, uh, looking at uh, this extremely large and complicated country, whether we will hear some insights into the question whether the state is failing. One might argue, one could argue, I think, that there is a question of, of uh, diminishing regime legitimacy in Egypt, although I don't think anybody questions the durability of the cohesion of the state. Whereas in the case of Sudan, uh, one has uh, a regime of, uh, well, I won't even try to characterize that because our speaker, who has just, just arrived back from the Sudan, will be a 
much better able to talk about that. But clearly there is a larger issue of whether the state of Sudan as we know it uh, is in fact uh, failing and in particular whether it is about to break in two. Because as I think you know, there is a referendum scheduled for next month uh, to determine whether the southern region uh, will break off and become somehow separate from Khartoum. So we're looking uh, at, at two critical issues. These are large <coughs> populated states with very, very important uh, human and material resources, the strategic uh, reach, uh, the implications of their instability would, would I think, uh, be felt uh, throughout the whole region. And we will, uh, I think, perhaps be able to draw some conclusions from all this uh, as to perhaps the more general question of regime legitimacy in this rather authoritarian zone that we work on in the Middle East and the question of state failure. State failure, when we think of it in the Middle East, of course, uh, these days we think of states like Somalia and Yemen, which are uh, in their own ways a state of a certain degradation and disintegration. Uh, but these two cases that we're going to look at today are much, much bigger, uh, and the ramifications of problems there, serious problems, could be severe. Let me briefly introduce our speakers. We are very fortunate, first of all, that one of Egypt's most uh, distinguished scholars and political scientists, Professor Mustafa Khan, was cited, uh, was able to join us, was able to accept our invitation to come from Cairo uh, to speak with us this afternoon and present his findings about the latest parliamentary election results and equally, I hope, uh, his analysis of what uh, lies ahead when uh, Egypt's next presidential election is scheduled. Dr. Syed uh, was educated in Egypt and Switzerland. Uh, his PhD is from the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva. He's been teaching at Cairo University and also at the American University of Cairo for many years. He's also had visiting appointments at UCLA and Harvard, among other places, uh, and he spent uh, a uh, fall semester, I see, uh, teaching courses at Colgate University uh, lately as well. Mustafa Khan Sayed has been active both in the academy and also outside the academy. He has held positions in the Egyptian Human Rights Organization and in the Arab Political Science Association. He has served as a member of the Committee on Global Security and Cooperation of the U.S. Social Science Research Council. Uh, he has spent time uh, as a visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in New York. Uh, he has published widely in Arabic, English, and French. And his field, he's an all-purpose political scientist, I would say, having known him now for many years. Um, he works on political economy, human rights, civil society, uh, and he delves into international relations uh, from time to time. He's a principal author of the latest, or one of the most recent uh, international publications, the Arab Human Development Report. Uh, uh, he is, uh, if I had to uh, identify one specialist on Egyptian politics uh, that I would like to hear from, if I could only hear from one, I think this is, this is the man I would want to hear from. And I think this is the man you will want to hear from. So I'm going to... Uh, pass the microphone and the podium to him, and then after he is finished, I will introduce our other distinguished speaker who will address the question of Sudan. After both speakers have spoken, uh, we suggest that we all take a very short break, have a cup of tea outside, but then quickly reconvene for an open discussion both on the Egyptian and the Sudanese question, and I will urge those of you that have an interest in delving into the
connections and interrelatedness between Egypt and Sudan. There are many such connections to uh, perhaps uh, raise those issues at that time. So uh, without further ado, uh, here is Professor uh, Mustafa Kamal Sayyid. Thank you very much, Professor Michael Hudson. Um, I am very happy to have this opportunity to come here on the invitation of Professor Michael Hudson, from whose work I did learn much. And I'm happy also to be in Singapore. You know, I, this is not my first time here. You know, I came to Singapore several times. But I admire the high ranking of Singapore in terms of human development, the transparency, the quality of the educational system. Um, and uh, as I spent uh, two years, working on issues of urban planning, I find Singapore to be very well and beautifully planned. So I'm very happy to be here, and I thank you very much for coming to listen to this talk. Uh, I'll start by you know, explaining the major points of my talk. I you know, formulate my main thesis. I talk about the importance of the 2010 uh, People's Assembly elections in Egypt. I talk about the major actors the political context, the electoral procedure and the election campaign, the election results, and then I'll explain the domestic, regional, and international implications, and I'll end up by talking about the future uh, prospects. Uh, now, the, uh, this uh, election, <laughs> despite uh, the fact that, uh, of course, is not um, a perfect <laughs> example, is not at all an example of a fair and free election, but still, it is important for several reasons. Uh, First of all, because it comes one year before the presidential elections in 2011. And uh, although the Egyptian constitution was amended in 2005 and uh, made the nomination of the president uh, to be uh, something left to political parties, so the uh, People's Assembly uh, is not empowered, as was the case before, to nominate the candidate for presidential elections, but still the uh, assembly plays an important uh, part uh, because the uh, parties uh, who have the right to uh, nominate candidates uh, are only the parties which are represented in the assembly. Uh, secondly, also, for a non-party presidential candidate, uh, um, he has to win endorsement of 65 members of the assembly. Uh, so for this reason, the assembly, this election is important because it will define uh, the political parties that will run uh, candidates in the presidential election and will decide also whether there will be an independent candidate or not. Besides also, when a new president is elected, uh, um, he has um, a political program and this program would require certain uh, legislations and this assembly would uh, make its uh, voice known about the uh, legislative program of the new president. Uh, secondly also, um, this is the first election after the constitutional amendments of 2007, uh, which um, uh, ended uh, judicial uh, direct supervision of uh, elections uh, and uh, which uh, uh, introduced uh, certain restrictions uh, on uh, freedom of um, expression, particularly of political parties. Uh, so this is the chance to see whether these uh, amendments would be um, uh, carried out or not. Um, thirdly, also, um, the, this is the first election after the major success of the Muslim Brothers uh, in the past election in 2005, in which they obtained something like 20% of the seats, so people were um, waiting to see whether the Muslim Brothers uh, would continue their electoral successes uh, or, you know, that um, uh, the electoral performance uh, of the Muslim Brothers would be uh, less than what was achieved in 2005. Uh, also, this is the um, first um, elect uh, legislative election that takes place under the Obama administration. And as you know, uh, President Bush, I don't think he was really committed to the cause of democracy, but he talked much about the promotion of democracy and that um, the promotion of democracy in the Middle East was in the national interest of the U.S. So what would be the reaction of President Obama to elections in Egypt? Would President Obama talk also about promotion of democracy in Egypt and would decide 
the position of the U.S. Uh, on the basis of the extent to which the Egyptian government respects the rules of the fair and free election or not. Uh, so uh, this election is also a test for the Obama administration and for the European Union, uh, which um, made it almost an article of faith uh, to support uh, civil society and human rights in the uh, Middle East. Uh, my main thesis is that um, you know this um, uh, Egypt was coming to a turning point in its um, uh, political evolution. A process of political liberalization started in Egypt uh, with President Sadat in 1976. Um, uh, opposition parties were authorized. authorized. Uh, it's true that President Sadat changed his mind about political liberalization in the last two years of his um, regime. Uh, President Hosni Mubarak expanded this process of political uh, liberalization um, and uh, this uh, process has um, uh, uh, gone further uh, since 2004, 2005 uh, with the uh, coming uh, into being uh, of certain civil society movements uh, which expanded very much the political agenda of Egypt, uh, some issues which were almost a taboo became uh, issues of public debate in the country. Uh, also, there has been um, a proliferation of independent newspapers, independent uh, TV channels. Uh, there has been also an, an unprecedented level of uh, social uh, protest in the country. Uh, um, so this uh, has been a deepening of political liberalization in Egypt. Uh, and with, with this deepening political liberalization in the country, the question arose whether this political liberalization will continue to political democratization. In other words, would the expansion of freedom of expression and freedom of association lead also to the possibility of a change of government through the ballot box in Egypt, or you know, we would see reversal. So um, uh, I guess, I think uh, this election constituted a sort of reversal. The government felt that if political liberalization would continue, uh, particularly, you know, as large numbers of people express the view that the um, Egyptian constitution uh, should be amended in order to allow for, you know, independent candidates to contest the presidential election uh, and called for a change of the basic rules of the regime, the regime felt that this is the moment uh, to tighten political control and not to continue the process of political liberalization. Because if this continues, uh, then, you know, there is a threat of democratization. I say threat uh, from the point of view of the regime, definitely not from the point of view of civil society movements which called for this uh, political uh, change. So my main thesis is that this is a moment of tightening up of political control in the country. Now, in order to you know, ex um, uh, uh, explain this thesis, uh, I would like to start by identifying the major actors. Uh, but the major actors in elections in Egypt are not the same that we would see in um, other countries. First of all, of course, the ruling party, the National um, uh, Democratic uh, uh, Party, uh, and people say that you know this party is split. There is a sort of split um, at the leadership of this party between the old guards uh, who uh, would like to maintain you know state control over the economy, uh, who would go uh, continue a process of political uh, liberalization, and there is the young uh, guards and people who are close to the son of the president, Gamal Mubarak, who is rumored, in fact, to have presidential uh, ambitions. And the young guards um, is made up mostly of businessmen who um, have um, made large fortunes. And they lack the caution and the political skills of the old uh, guards. So this is the major actor. The second, uh, this actor, in fact, you know, operates through the Ministry of Interior. And the Ministry of Interior in Egypt is not the ministry uh, concerned with um, uh, 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 local affairs, but it is the uh, ministry uh, in charge of uh, security. Um, so this is the second major actor. Why I say it is the second major actor? Because for anyone to be a candidate, he does not present uh, his uh, papers uh, to a government institution or to an independent institution, but presents it to the police. And the, the uh, Ministry of Interior uh, does, uh, it, does uh, issue the uh, voters' um, uh, lists 
and um, it used to announce the results of the elections. So the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of you know, Internal Security is the second major actor. And then we have something called Independent Electoral Commission. Um, this is, um, in principle, this is the commission which is in charge of announcing the results of the elections. Uh, it sets the rules for elections. It appoints also the officials who run the um, uh, electoral process, who run voting and the counting of uh, votes. This um, uh, electoral commission is made up of 11 persons, uh, four of whom are judges. Uh, the presidents of the courts of appeal of Cairo and Alexandria, and two other judges who are chosen by the uh, Supreme Constitutional Court uh, and by the Council of State. And then seven others uh, who are uh, chosen by both the People's Assembly and the uh, Advisory uh, Assembly. The Egyptian Parliament it made, is made up of two houses. Uh, um, the lower house, the most powerful, is the People's Assembly, and the upper house is the Shura, or Advisory um, Assembly. And the two of them are completely dominated, uh, almost completely dominated uh, by the NDP. The NDP has 80% of the seats in the People's Assembly and has over 90% of the seats in the um, Advisory Assembly. So if these two assemblies appoint seven of the 11 members of the Independent Electoral Commission, then the Independent Electoral Commission is not really independent, but it is, you know, it reflects definitely the views and the preferences of the uh, National Democratic Party. Then we have the major opposition uh, parties, and um, we have about 24 parties in Egypt, but, you know, uh, four of these parties you know, are uh, important uh, because they have some following, uh, they have uh, some influence uh, over the public opinion. Uh, these are the Waft Liberal Party, uh, the um, uh, leftist Tajamo uh, Party, and the nationalist, uh, the um, uh, Arab Democratic Nasserite Party, and the new party called the uh, Party of the Democratic Front. Uh, these parties came together and asked for political reform and uh, were not sure to uh, participate in this election or not. And uh, three of them ended up participating in the first round of elections. The fourth party decided to boycott the election completely. And the three parties who had decided to contest the first round of elections, you know, decided after the first round to withdraw completely from the electoral process. Then we have the Muslim Brothers, who are not a party, uh, but they are tolerated as an organization. But the government, from the time to time, says, well, you are not a legal party, but you are exercising political party activities, and therefore, we are going to put you in uh, prison. But the Muslim Brothers is the most important opposition group in the country. As I told you, it won 20% of the seats in 2005. The other opposition parties, all of them, uh, won one-fifth of what the Muslim Brothers uh, won. So they all together won 17 seats, and the Muslim Brothers uh, obtained 88 seats. And then, uh, importantly, there are civil society movements, uh, which have become very active in Egypt. Uh, and there are many of these movements, but the, the most important of which is the uh, National uh, Association for Change, which was led, you know, in the beginning by Mohammed al Baradei, the former Director General of the International Atomic Energy um, Agency. And this the leaders of this association uh, took the position that the legislative election should be boycotted completely uh, by all uh, opposition parties and movements in Egypt uh, because the election uh, the electoral process uh, is not credible um, uh, at all. And the leaders of this uh, association uh, went around, met leaders of all the um, opposition parties, met the leaders of the Muslim Brothers in order to persuade them not to take part in the um, election. Uh, nevertheless, as I said, these opposition parties decided to uh, take part in the election. And, you know, after the first round, they came around uh, to the position which had been advocated uh, by the National Association of uh, change. The National Association of Change collected almost one million signatures calling for um, uh, constitutional change in uh, Egypt and for Mohammed Baradi to be a presidential candidate. There are other uh, civil society movements in Egypt. Uh, many of them are established by young people and they are uh, very active and they made their presence uh, uh, known in, on the political scene. Then, you know, uh, there is one group which I call the new socio-economic elite. Um, 
uh, those are people who made their wealth um, and uh, they are not uh, prominent uh, businessmen but they like to you know acquire you know having made wealth they would like to have also a measure of power and prestige and therefore in fact um, uh, almost 40 uh, almost um, 80% of the candidates in this election do not belong to any political party, do not belong to the Muslim Brothers. They are people without you know, political affiliations and without even any political background. And they don't have any political program. But they are you know, um, wealthy people in local areas and they would like you know, their wealth to be recognized and they would like to combine prestige and power next to their uh, wealth. The uh, political context of this uh, election, uh, first of all, this election took place under the state of emergency. And Egypt has been living under a state of emergency uh, uh, uninterruptedly since 1981 and even uh, before that. And the state of emergency is renewed every three years and every time the government would say that we are not going to use the state of emergency uh, to restrict political freedom in the country, it will be used only against, you know, uh, people involved in drug trafficking, uh, people involved in crimes, but will not be used for political purposes, but in fact it, is, it has been used. Uh, then the second um, uh, element uh, of this political context uh, was the rise and decline of the National Association for Change. The National Association for Change became very prominent in Egyptian politics uh, when Mohammed Baradi declared his support for the cause of political change in the country. And he came and met many people and gathered a uh, large amount of support, but uh, he has other occupations outside of Egypt. So he does not stay long in the country. And because of the fact that, you know, um, he comes to the country only when he does not have, you know, any international conference or an invitation to give a lecture abroad, huh? because of this, you know, the, um, uh, his association huh? lost uh, some credibility and it is not clear you know, what sort of political program he has. He uh, also abandoned any close link with this association, so nobody knows, you know, what sort of uh, political group he counts on. And this has affected very much the credibility of this um, uh, association. So this was, you know, uh, an element of the uh, background. Uh, thirdly, um, some restrictions were introduced on freedom of uh, expression in the country. Uh, popular uh, TV anchors were removed, um, some TV channels were closed completely. Uh, the popular editor-in-chief of one independent newspaper uh, was removed also from this uh, post. Uh, TV stations were banned from uh, directly transmitting from um, electoral, uh, from voting stations. Uh, so, you know, this atmosphere of, you know, uh, restrictions uh, on freedom of expression was also an element of the political context. If we come to the um, election campaign, um, first of all, it is important to know something about the electoral uh, procedure. Uh, you know, for anyone to be a candidate, he has to submit, uh, he or she uh, should submit their uh, documents uh, to, you know, police officers. Uh, um, and, um, you know, police officers would decide whether to accept this or not. Uh, but, you know, those candidates uh, could um, uh, contest this, uh, they could go to the courts and they would go to an administrative court. Uh, the Council of State in Egypt has courts uh, which are uh, empowered to decide uh, cases uh, of dispute between people and uh, uh, the uh, government. Uh, so uh, what happened is that uh, tens of people were prevented uh, from submitting their uh, papers uh, to the police station and they went to the uh, administrative courts and the court decided that it is their right to be candidates. So they would go back to the police stations and would try to submit their papers and the police stations would not accept this. So they would go again to the Supreme Administrative Court which would decide that they have the right to be candidates but this would not be accepted by the Independent Electoral Commission because it would say that the Ministry of Interior has contested this and that, but has contested this not in front, not before administrative courts. But uh, the Ministry of Interior will go to a court which is in charge of uh, deciding urgent matters. Uh, but this is not an administrative court. So from a strictly legal point of view, this you know, kind of objection by the Ministry of Interior is not, uh, is not admissible uh, 
because the Ministry of Interior has to go to an administrative court. But this is a way of delaying, of gaining time. Because by the time the Supreme Administrative Court you know, decides that you know, those people have the right to be candidates, either it would be too late for them to run their election campaign or the, election, the elections would have taken place. And this has happened with a large number of candidates. And as a result of this, the Supreme Administrative Court decided that the elections in, um, I think, almost uh, 182 constituencies uh, were invalid because the people who had the right to run as candidates in these constituencies did not uh, get uh, to be uh, to run their election uh, campaigns. Uh, so this is, you know, one important issue which would cast doubt uh, on the future of this uh, uh, assembly. Uh, the Ministry of Interior was in charge of uh, getting the applications uh, and was also in charge of um, you know, protecting. Uh, 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 voting stations, but uh, what happened is that um, either the uh, policemen uh, would, you know, uh, go into the voting stations themselves and would supervise the process of voting and the counting of votes, or they would leave it, this is a new phenomenon in Egypt, and all newspapers talked about it, they would give thugs, thugs you know, intimidating voters, uh, if they know that those voters are not going to vote for um, their favorite candidate, who would be, most of the time, the a candidate of the National Democratic Party, uh, or would simply um, prevent people from going to vote. And the policemen, in fact, would just leave these thugs do their jobs. And uh, interesting enough, the period of election is a good period for these thugs. They can make much money. And it is known, you know, there are rates for what kind of action they can take. If they um, are there just to prevent the people from going to vote, then there is one rate. If they go and hit those voters, there is another vote. And if the hit is fatal, then there is, you know, a higher rate, etc. And there are certain personalities which were, you know, reported on in newspapers. And all this does take place with the presence of security forces. The Independent Electoral Commission, even if we assume that it has the intention of doing its job, it has no means. You know, for a long time, uh, political party candidates uh, complain that they don't know even the telephone number, the uh, fax number, or the email address of this commission. They don't know where uh, it is. And when they know, they find out that it has, I think, about six employees. So. The, you know, to supervise elections in the country, it has only six employees. So therefore, in fact, the um, actual supervision of the election is left to the Ministry of Interior, and the uh, Independent Electoral Commission would say, well, we agree to what has been decided by the Ministry of um, uh, Interior. Uh, the number, surprisingly, the number of candidates, you know, is very high. Um, the um, uh, we have 400. Uh, 222 constituencies in the country. So, uh, but we had something like 5,000 uh, candidates. Uh, so this is, you know, so each seat of the assembly was contested by 10 persons. So you could say that this is a highly competitive election. Uh, but 80% um, of those candidates do not belong to any political party. So only 20% of them belong to uh, political uh, uh, parties. Uh, so um, uh, 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 and. Of the uh, almost you know, over 1,000 who belong to political parties, 800 belong to the National Democratic Party, and um, you know something like 130, 150 uh, are uh, candidates of the Waft Party, the Liberal Party, and the, the Muslim uh, Brothers. And uh, so you know almost you know a little over 1,000 are candidates of political parties and movements, uh, but you know the other 4,000 do not belong to any uh, political uh, party. Uh, a new innovation in this election, it was decided to have um, a quota for women. So 68 seats were reserved for uh, women. Uh, the election campaign itself was very short. The government you know, took care to shorten uh, the period of the uh, election campaign. And it chose a time. So all the time left for the election campaign was three weeks. And during the three weeks, we had one week for Eid al-Adha holiday. So you know, this left very little time 
for uh, candidates and any candidate who try to uh, uh, start the election campaign before that data would be penalized for this, particularly if he is a Muslim brother. Uh, you know, if he is a Muslim brother, the other candidates who don't have any political program were allowed, you know, to uh, put uh, posters, you know, everywhere. But Muslim brothers, you know, if they would start the election campaign earlier, then they would be um, uh, penalized um, uh, for this. Uh, what was remarkable about the election campaign is that there was no political debate. It's surprising, you know, during the election campaign, you expect debate, you know, about alternative domestic policies, alternative, you know, uh, regional policies. Um, there are many problems in Egypt, and you would expect the candidates to suggest, you know, how to deal with the country's problems. There was no debate, not one single debate about, you know, political issues. Uh, the candidates were, you know, there was, uh, the candidates not even bother to suggest, um, you know, solutions for the problems of the country. Uh, so they would say, elect me because I am the best person to represent you or elect me because I come from your village, or I come from your city, or because I'm a good man or a good woman. Huh? But there was complete absence huh, of political debate in this um, uh, election. Now, the election took place. Uh, there were two uh, rounds of elections. Huh? And um, the rate of participation, as to be expected, the rate of electoral participation in Egypt is very low, very low. Even in the last uh, election, 2005, uh, According to official figures, and the official figures did not really reflect the reality, but the official figures suggested that the rate of participation was something like 25% of uh, the registered voters. Uh, this time, the uh, participation rate was very low. Uh, in the first and the second round of uh, elections, uh, uh, we don't have um, uh, highly reliable figures, uh, but the estimates of uh, human rights organizations, which, uh, you know, observed the election was that the um, rate of participation was something like 15 percent according to the uh, independent uh, commission you know it went up to 25 30 percent but no one suggested that that it is over this uh, level the winners um, um, three cops 500 muslims and this is very important uh, because the percentage of cops in the country is definitely over 10 percent uh, but uh, political parties did not have uh, a large number of uh, Copts, they will have a considerable number of Copts. The National Democratic Party had 800 candidates and 10 of them uh, are Copts. So this is, you know, less than, um, you know, a little more than 1%. Uh, percent. The other parties had, you know, a number of Copts on their lists, but, you know, was not uh, reflected at all the percentage of Copts in the uh, country. And, of the three cops, I think one of them is a minister, is a very important minister, is the minister of uh, finance, uh, and the two others are uh, independent uh, candidates. Uh, the NDP, the ruling party, um, ended up uh, getting uh, uh, 474 uh, seats, uh, and this you know, accounts for something like 96% uh, of the seats of the assembly. All opposition parties together got 15 uh, seats, uh, and um, they got five seats in the first round of elections. And uh, this became very embarrassing for the government because, you know, uh, the election means that there should be, you know, an opposition in the parliament. So the government actively helped the opposition candidates, some opposition candidates, in the second round in order to show that, you know, there is, you know, some opposition in the uh, parliament. So in the second round, we find candidates of the National Democratic Party complaining against the government, uh, that it was rigging the election uh, in favor of the opposition. It did not do this uh, because it believes in the importance of the opposition, but just to maintain the facade. Uh, um, so as a result of this, the presence of opposition candidates increased from five in the first round uh, to you know, 15 with 10 others in the second round. However, the uh, major opposition parties, the Wafd and the Muslim Brothers, uh, decided that after the first round, when they saw that um, Wafd, I think, won two seats. The Muslim Brothers did not win any seat. Uh, they uh, found that uh, the um, election was marred by rigging, so they decided to boycott the second round. Nevertheless, some of their candidates decided to maintain their candidacy, and therefore they won. Now it is uh, a major question whether these parties would allow those people to remain speaking uh, um, in their name in the assembly. 
We have 70 women who have um, won. 68 of them belong to the um, uh, quota, and two others, you know, do not belong to uh, the quota, and uh, don't belong to the, the quota. Uh, and uh, so the re uh, elections ended with a massive, unprecedented domination of the ruling party uh, by the ruling party of the SNP. This has never been the case before. In 1976, 1979, 1984, the, um, in fact, the voting strength of the National uh, Democratic Party has been declining over the years. So this election, at least the official results of this election, show that you know the party has succeeded uh, in changing its uh, uh, fortunes uh, by getting this 97% of the seats at a time when you know um, uh, socio-economic protest movements are on the rise in the country. So it is you know very interesting uh, to see you know a, an escalation uh, of protest movements, which suggests uh, dissatisfaction uh, by the people, and at the same time the party getting almost you know unanimous uh, support. Now, what are the domestic implications? The first one is that you know the uh, the election itself became an issue of you know controversy in the country. Um, uh, the, um, not just um, the uh, leaders of opposition parties who did not win much in the um, election, uh, but also independent observers uh, do recognize that the election was marked by several irregularities. Uh, first of all, you know, banning the presence, uh, disregarding court rulings. You know, there were you know binding court rulings uh, asking the authorities uh, to recognize uh, some candidates. Uh, uh, and the, the government did not accept this. And as a result of this, uh, the courts, the Supreme Minister of Court, decided uh, that the elections uh, were invalid in several constituencies. Nevertheless, the government went and you know carried out elections in these constituencies. So, the disregard for uh, binding court rulings. This is one of the uh, problems of this election. Secondly, also banning the presence of candidates observers. Each candidate has the right to authorize you know, some people uh, to observe uh, voting and the counting of vote. And those people went and got the authorization uh, from a certain government institution. Uh, but when they would go uh, to exercise this job of um, uh, observing the election, they would be told that, in fact, uh, uh, they must get the authorization not from this government institution, but from the police officer in charge. They have to go to the police station uh, in order to get the authorization. And even if they get this authori authorization, they would not uh, be able to penetrate the voting station unless the uh, chairman of um, the employees who you know supervise the election allows them to get in. Uh, so this is again you know another violation of the uh, electoral law. And then, you know, human rights organization, the government said, we don't accept international observers uh, because we trust very much uh, Egyptian civil society. But when representatives of um, uh, Egyptian civil society organizations asked for the authorization to uh, observe the election, uh, most of them were not given this right. But the right to observe the election was given to organizations which have nothing to do with politics or human rights. Uh, you know, organizations which uh, uh, take care of uh, the environment or who are, you know, trying to combat illiteracy or who do not exercise any activity. So these are the organizations which were given the uh, authorization to observe elections. But human rights organizations, the Egyptian human rights organization asked for 1,100 authorizations. It got only 150 uh, authorizations and the other Credible human rights organizations were banned completely from observing the uh, election. And then, you know, the uh, widespread restriction on voters. You know, certain villages uh, would be barred completely from voting. You know, uh, either um, the yeah, people would go to vote and they would find out that the voting station is closed. Or, you know, they would be allowed two hours later uh, and they find out that this, during these two hours, uh, ballot stuffing was taking uh, place. Um, uh, ballot stuffing also was you know, quite widespread, uh, and then the use of thugs, you know, in order to intimidate voters, uh, and the uh, buying of, uh, of uh, votes. Uh, someone who works 
<laughs> with me at the office. You know, he is the office boy. You know, the election for him are very good because you know he will go and uh, in several constituencies, in fact, in several voting stations, he will go and you know uh, sell his vote and go to ask him how much do you get. And he is very happy when there are um, elections. Uh, and um, so all these, you know, make the election an object of controversy in Egypt. And there are calls on the president, in fact. Uh, to dissolve the assembly and to order uh, new um, elections. And these you know, suggestions are so serious uh, as to get the Secretary General of the ruling party to say that there is no intention already, that there is no intention of dissolving the assembly. So this shows that you know, this uh, call for dissolving the assembly because of all the doubts about the um, of, uh, credibility of the election are uh, quite uh, serious. Uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, uh, people thought, or some people thought, that uh, the uh, uh, opening the political process uh, to the Islamists would, you know, pave the way for integrating them in a peaceful uh, political process, uh, and this is, you know, important for the democratic evolution of uh, the country, because uh, in fact there are no free elections in Egypt anywhere. You know, students, uh, stu university students, don't have free elections. University professors don't have free elections. Uh, even in chambers of commerce, you know, you'll find, you know, policemen, you know, standing in front of chambers of commerce when there are elections. Why? Because there is this fear that these elections will be dominated by the Muslim Brothers. So integrating the Muslim Brothers in a peaceful political process, uh, I think, you know, should uh, open the way for lifting all the restrictions on the exercise of political rights in the country. So with no presence at all of the Muslim Brothers in the People's Assembly, so there is no chance of integrating the Islamists in a peaceful political process. Also, this election, you know, marked the, the restoration of a single party rule. You know, if you have 90% of the seats in the hands of the ruling party, then you know, Egypt is just like I don't know the People's Republic of China. You know, so this is effectively a single party rule. This cannot be a multi-party uh, system. Uh, finally, this you know narrows the chance. Uh, of peaceful uh, political change in uh, Egypt uh, with the um, <clears throat> next presidential elections contested by the uh, candidate of the National Democratic Party uh, facing uh, political parties that have no following in the country. So uh, the victory of the candidate of the National Democratic Party is uh, certain. Uh, and uh, we know already that no candidate of the National Democratic Party has a program for uh, serious political reform in the country. Uh, so uh, how would you know, peaceful political change be introduced in the country uh, if uh, there are no forces uh, calling for this change within the People's Assembly? And you know, as a result of the elections of the People's Assembly, there is no chance uh, for a reform-oriented candidate uh, to run for the presidency uh, next year. Uh, so this closes the door for you know, peaceful political change in the country. And I think this is the most worrying uh, because people who would like you know, peaceful political change in the country, as they have no chance, uh, then they will think of uh, non-peaceful methods of uh, change. Now, what are the regional implications? Uh, Egypt used to stand as a role model in the Arab world. Uh, you know, in fact, the first uh, parliament in the Arab world, the first legislative assembly in the Arab world, was in Egypt in the 60s of the 19th century. Uh, so with this, you know, countries like, you know, Yemen, uh, Morocco, uh, the uh, Palestine had all free and fair elections. Uh, so Egypt, in fact, is standing behind, you know, all these countries. So in fact, it is not a model of, you know, um, uh, democratic change. It's not a good model. It's not a positive model in the Arab world. In fact, it is uh, a negative uh, model. Uh, secondly, also, uh, this is uh, the death uh, for uh, of this call for effective democracy promotion in the uh, Arab world. Uh, as Egypt, the largest uh, Arab country in terms of population, uh, having this kind of election. <clears throat> so, you know, um, the prospect for a democratic change in the Arab world you know, is deep, uh, uh, particularly because in 2005 there were articles in newspapers celebrating the uh, democracy spring <clears throat> in the Arab world. Uh, so, this election, definitely, of course, with what happened in Palestine, <clears throat> this call for you know uh, uh, democracy promotion, you know, has um, um, uh, ended. Uh, you know, the uh, the international um, uh, reactions to the election in Egypt, uh, 
a spokesman not of the White House, but of the National Security Council of the U.S., said that, that the, these elections are disappointing. Uh, and uh, the EU called for investigating the irregularities in the election. Uh, so there has been no comment, I think, from uh, Mrs. Hillary Clinton. Uh, there has been no comment from the White House. The spokesman for the White House did not say anything about this election. So this shows that, you know, this call for democracy promotion in the Middle East is, um, I think, uh, uh, is not to be taken uh, seriously. Yeah. But the important question is why, you know, the question of democracy in the Middle East is not taken seriously. I think it's not taken seriously because the, exa the example of 2005 in Egypt and 2006 in Palestine sh uh, shows that um, if there are fair and uh, fair elections, if there are free and fair elections in the Arab world, uh, then, you know, the Islamists would win, or they might not win massively, but at least, you know, their power would increase. And uh, neither the U.S. nor the European Union, uh, nor China, nor Russia would like to see this gaining power in the uh, Arab world, no matter how moderate they are. I don't think the Muslim brothers are going to declare war on the U.S. or even on Israel. However, they are seen as, you know, enemies of uh, the West. Uh, and therefore, you know, there is no, not much enthusiasm for democracy in the Arab world. There might be much enthusiasm for democracy in Latin America, in Africa, south of the Sahara, but definitely not in the um, Arab world. What does this say for the future of um, uh, Egypt? You know, one question, would this uh, people's assembly complete its term? I think uh, it would uh, continue at least for two years. I mean, it would continue. Uh, until the presidential elections. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are used in Egypt that a new president usually starts by opening up the political space. Uh, so maybe with the election of a new president in 2011, he would start by dissolving the assembly, uh, you know, in order to, you know, establish his legitimacy. Later on, I think he would repeat, the, maybe he might, he might repeat. Uh, the same kind of behavior as President Hosni Mubarak, but definitely I don't expect this assembly to be uh, uh, dissolved. Uh, on Sunday, uh, President Hosni Mubarak is going to uh, meet uh, members of the National Democratic Party who is going to meet 97% of uh, the members of the assembly, and I think this meeting would mean that the President Act approves the results of the uh, election. So the uh, Elected, the uh, assembly would complete its term, uh, um, and uh, the presidential uh, elections uh, next year uh, would see, as I said, you know, a candidate of the National Democratic Party. And since the uh, major opposition parties boycotted the election, they would have no candidate, and uh, the Muslim Brothers would not be able to uh, mobilize the necessary number of endorsements for an independent uh, candidate, nor would uh, a person like Mohammed Barani. So uh, we are not going to see an independent candidate, and we are not going to see also a credible uh, uh, opposition party candidate. So in fact, uh, this election decided already the outcome of presidential elections of 2011. And as we don't see within the National Democratic Party anyone you know, proposing that, you know, serious political reform, uh, then, you know, I think that this, you know, period of stagnation uh, in Egypt will continue if things remain as they are. However, things might not remain as they are because uh, there is uh, a rise of civil society movements in Egypt and the reactions of the people suggest that they don't accept this as something uh, that uh, uh, is truly uh, democratic. So, uh, uh, the future of Egypt, you know, in light of this election, would depend very much on the capacity of opposition groups to be able to work together. There is talk now about, you know, all opposition groups, you know, coming together, and um, uh, I think they would try, you know, if they, even if they don't come together, I think they would try to use the legal uh, method of challenging the results of this election. And I think this is quite promising, in the sense that, you know, the uh, Supreme and Muslim Court decided already that the elections in a large number of constituencies were invalid. Uh, so, you know, would this lead to the dissolution of the assembly? Uh, I think this is, you know, a serious um, question. Uh, uh, the government would, uh, might go to the Supreme Constitutional Court uh, 
um, in order to uh, get its view whether the assembly should be uh, dissolved or not. But definitely, the legal method of action, I think, would be used by the opposition groups. Would they um, try something else besides, you know, legal uh, struggle? Uh, I think the um, uh, civil society movements are eager. <laughs> in fact, civil society movements would like, you know, to go into popular mobilization in order to, uh, you know, force the regime to introduce uh, amendments. But uh, so far, I think they have not been able uh, to mobilize large numbers of people. There have been, as I said, unprecedented level of uh, social protest actions. You know, people would uh, organize strikes, demonstrations, uh, in order to call for lower prices, you know, higher wages, uh, improvement in living conditions. But we would not see, we did not see large numbers of people uh, mobilizing in favor of uh, political change. So would uh, uh, political protest and social protest, you know, come together with, you know, uh, these two movements of social protest and political protest come together? So this is you know, an open question. I think it is not possible to answer this question now, but I think it depends very much on the capacity of opposition groups to work together that, you know, the future of Egypt would be decided. And uh, political scientists recognize that they are good at making predictions. And so I think this is the only, this is the only valid lesson I could get from political science. So I would not say anything about, uh, you know, the, uh, the prospects of the uh, middle term in Egypt. I'm happy to tell you that the assembly is not going to be resolved. So I still made some prediction. Huh? So I'm happy with myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to give everybody a chance to take a two minute break to stretch. Uh, we won't take questions now, but please uh, save your questions and comments that you may have uh, based on Professor Mustafa's extremely excellent talk. And we'll have a chance for general discussion later. But uh, let's all stretch our legs for two minutes, and then uh, we will turn to uh, Professor. program. Uh, we've now had a, a fairly uh, upbeat and optimistic assessment of the Egyptian political scene. Uh, now, uh, whether, whether this uh, trend of optimism will continue uh, remains to be seen, but we are certainly in very good hands to be guided through the uh, complexities and the very, very serious issues that are facing Sudan. And I'm really happy uh, that we were able to persuade uh, Dr. Ahmed Ibrahim Awashouk to uh, join us here in Singapore today. It, it has not been easy for him, uh, and uh, he is still, I suspect, a little bit jet-lagged because he has just come from Sudan. He has been uh, studying and analyzing uh, Sudanese affairs for a long time. He's just returning from uh, a visit, stopping only briefly uh, in uh, his home base uh, Kuala Lumpur at the International Islamic University, but we're really happy that uh, he could uh, come down, you know, even though this must be a bit uh, physically trying for him. Uh, he is not the first visitor, and I think he's not the last visitor that we're going to be having from Malaysia, because uh, we have learned that uh, in uh, Malaysia there is uh, a rather more advanced condition uh, of uh, academic work on the Arab world, and the Islamic world, than there is in Singapore. And uh, we have no uh, uh, reservations about uh, trying to exploit the uh, talents uh, that are available uh, not very far from here. Dr. Albert uh, PhD, uh, we have another European PhD in here. Uh, his is uh, from the University of Bergen in Norway. He is currently professor of history at the Department of History and Civilization at the International Islamic University in Malaysia. And he is the director of the International Institute for Muslim Unity. Um, he has an extremely impressive record of scholarly publication in Arabic, 
and also uh, in English. He's done major uh, archival work on uh, uh, Arabic periodicals. He has done uh, extensive studies of the parliamentary uh, uh, records and situations uh, of the Sudan. And uh, he also has a volume that may be known to some of you here, and it just became known to me uh, recently, a very impressive uh, edited volume. He's, he's the co-editor and contributor to a, a volume in, in English uh, called the Hadrami Diaspora in Southeast Asia, Identity Maintenance or Assimilation. Uh, this is quite a new book. It's quite a very impressive collection. Uh, and uh, uh, his, his interests, therefore, speak not only to Islamic history and to the Sudan, but also uh, to the uh, historic, cultural, and uh, social uh, connections uh, that link Southeast Asia to South Arabia, the Hadramah. So for all sorts of reasons, we're happy to uh, welcome him here. And we look forward to his talk. Uh, after he finishes, we will again stretch for just a minute, but not too long, because we want to then open up the seminar for uh, your comments and questions, both to uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa Kamala Syed, but also to uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, so, uh, Zahim, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael and his audience as well. As a junior teacher, I prefer to stand if you don't mind. And I hope my presentation will be so impressive as that one of uh, Professor Mustafa because we share the same issue regarding the succession in Egypt and the succession in Sudan. For purpose of discussion, I'll divide my talk in four parts. In the first part, I address the features of the Sudan for those who know little about the country. And in the second part, I address the history of the election and the vicious circle of governance between military dictatorship and the democratic elected governments. And after that, I'll focus on comprehensive peace agreement that took place in 2002 and the requirement of this peace agreement will be the final part of my discussion because I need to focus on the national elections and the referendum that will take place in January 9, 2011. And also the first is, the slide is not encouraging at all because it, it shows some features of the sessions that will take place in the countries. But if we look at the history of the Sudan, the Sudan with its present borders was established by the Anglo-Egyptian administration in, 19, in 1898. And before that, the southern part of the country was not a part of the Turkey-Egyptian administration in the Sudan and the Mahdist state. Meaning that the southern part of the country became a part of the Sudan with its traditional borders in late 19th century and early 20th century. If we look to the country from ethnic perspective regarding the demography of the country, we find that the past majority would be classified as black and the second majority classified themselves as Arab. And Arab in this context has an ideological dimension, became ideology of political discourse in the country. The rest we have the villages and other ethnic groups. All in all we have about 56 ethnic groups we speak about 100 languages and the majority of them are in the southern part of the country. Religiously speaking, Muslims are dominant because we have about 70% of, 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 of the population are Muslims and 5% are Christians and the rest they follow their indigenous belief or indigenous religion. Uh, if we move or look at the time of uh, North House conflict, this is started from the very beginning of the colonial period when the British colonizers 
as this part of the country, the southern part, as the part of the old Sudan. And later on in 1902, the British introduced the administration of the closed districts. They totally separated the southern part of the country from the rest and used the English language as the lang as, as official language of the southern part of the countries and, leave, and they left the education for the Christian missionaries separating the southern part of the country from the north. After the establishment of the constitutional uh, institution in the northern part of the countries, the southerners realized that the, 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 the regions of the southern part of the country had been totally separated from the northern part of the country, and they held Juba Conference in 1947. And they tried to work together with the northern part of the country towards the independence. Before the independence, the Sudan also was in the same position of the southern part of the country today. The British colonizers gave the Sudanese the right to determine their future, whether to be part of Egypt or to establish their own country. And during the discussion and the dialogue, at that particular time, the Southerner called for a federal administration for the Southern part of the country in order to develop their own, the, 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 the Southern part of the country in a different line from the Northern part of the country. And this proposal didn't take place because it totally rejected by the Northern elites who controlled the process of decision making in Khartoum at that particular time. Then this rejection resulted in the outbreak of the, of, of the Paris Civil War that broke out in 1955 and continued until 1972, when Jafar Numeri, the president of Sudan at that time, endorsed the agreement or the terms of the Addis Agreement that gave the southern part of the country a certain degree of autonomy. But later on, Nimeri tried to adopt a policy of divide and rule, and divide the southern, the southern region into three provinces. Then this resulted in the outbreak of the war of 1983 under the leadership of John Brown, and continued until the endorsement of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005. This historical narrations indicate that there was a kind of conflict and an easygoing relation between the northern part and the southern part of the country. If we would like to put this kind of political discourse and conflict in the context of the administration of the states, I would argue that in Sudan we are in a real vicious sense because we fail to maintain the democratic system at the same time, we didn't accept the dictatorships led by the military forces. And in a, from 1953 up to 1958, we had a democratic government. But as a result of the conflict between the two political, two, the two major political parties, the military force moved in, and we had a military government from 1880. 1858 to, nine, to 1964, under the leadership of General Abud, and he faced a kind of popular uprisings and resulted in the step down of the military forces and the emergence of the second democracy. Continued from 1964 up to 1969 until General Numeri came in and controlled the country for 15 years. Okay. Then after that, we have a short democratic government under the leadership of Sadiq al Mahdi. It started from 18, 1985 up to 1989, and it was stopped by the General Bashir, who is now in power as elected president. I call this a vicious circle of governance in Sudan. It seems that we the political elite failed to manage the state in a very democratic manner, and this was the outcome. If we look at the democratic system from 19, 
35, we had about uh, four elections took place under democratic government in 1990, 1958, 1965, 1968, and 1986. Uh, in between, we have four or three uh, military regimes. Here, I'm going to discuss the discourse in the Sudan between the political parties and the issues that created tensions between the north and the southern part of the countries. This is the first uh, electoral commission chaired by an Indian uh, guy with, with a representation from Egypt and British and the United States of America. For this reason, we call it International Mixed Electoral Commissions, supervise the process of the election in 19. 53. At that time, the Sudan was under the condominium administration and didn't obtain his, it is independent yet. If we look at the distribution of the constituencies, we had two councils, the Senate and the, 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 the Council of Representatives. And the candidates for the constituency divided into three. For graduates, we have five seats, direct election, indirect election because the majority of the population of the country at that time were illiterate. Then they follow the, in, the direct elections, the indirect elections. And let us move from this to look at the political discourse and the political scenarios that take place in the countries. Here we have the British on the one hand and the Egyptian on the other. And this the legacy of the colonial period that affected the political discourse in Sudan. Besides that, also we have a kind of dichotomy between the two the dominant religious sects, the Khatmiya and the Ansar, the follower of the Mahdi and their opponent. On the other hand, we have the conflict between the South and the North. This kind of political scenario directly affected the political discourse. And here I have the name of the party, this national Unionist Party under the control of the Khatmiya and the Ummah Party under the control of the Ansar and, uh, and Socialist Republican Party dominated by the tribal leader and is sponsored by the British administration at that particular time. Here we have the, the, the Southern political parties and the independents. Let us see how this affected the outcome and the turnout of the election at that particular time. Here I have a few images from the election of 1953. If you look at the result, it is very clear that the political discourse controlled by these two parties, the National Unionist parties supported by the Khatmiya and the Ummah party supported by the Ansar and the representation of the Southern in the, inter in the national political discourse was very limited. They had only 10 seats in in, in the parliament and four seats for southern independent uh, candidates. Uh, then what I would like to say here is that even the, the southern political parties or the representation of the southern in the parliament, they didn't have any representation in the rest of the countries. And the only party who, who succeed in obtaining some seats in the southern part of the country was the DUP, the Ummah party, had its control in Central Sudan and some part of Western Sudan and Darfur in particular. Uh, uh, if we look at the election of 1958, uh, uh, the important feature here is the conflict between the traditionalist and modern forces, and the traditionalist. I mean the Ummah parties and the democratic DUP, in order to control the political scene, they abolish the graduate seats. And here you see the representation, there is no graduate seat. And they increase the constituency in the area of their representation, in their, in their, in their political hall. For example, look at Khartoum, they didn't increase the number of the constituency. But in Darfur, they increase it 100%. The same in Kordofan and the same in the north and eastern Sudan and in the north. 
this also reflects the kind of political discourse. We have it as a political landscape of, of, of the Sudan during that period. The hot issues used to be discussed in electoral campaigns include the conflict over Halai, this is a kind of disputed border with Egypt, and holiness in politics. The communists were totally against the involvement of the religious sectarian forces in political discourse. And on the other hand, we have, at that time, the British, the Americans start to involve in the internal politics of the Sudan. And this also creates some kind of problem and enmity between some political parties and, and affected the political scene to a great extent. This is a representation in the parliament. And we notice that the representation of the southerner was very limited in the election of 1958. The, the traditional forces control the political scene, particularly when unionist parties and the Khatmiya established their own party and walk away from the unionists at that particular time. And this is the Umar parties. It means that we had, since the independence, we had two traditional political forces that controlled the political scene under the democratic system. And they were in conflict and struggle with modern forces such as the communist and Muslim brothers at that particular time. If we look at the outcome of the election, the very interesting point we have first here is that the UP and any UP and PTP, they don't have any representation in the southern part of the country. This mainly controlled by, 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 by the Southern Political Party at that particular time. And then, as a result of this discourse, a new political party emerged in the sea. Regional parties, such as the Vija Congress Party in the northern part of the country, and Sanu in in, in, in the southern part of the country, and South Front in the southern part of the country, Unity Park in the southern part of the country, and 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 Unionist in the, and, and, and Nuba Union in the area of Kibalano. It means that the conflict in in, in the Sudan is start to take a kind of regional dimensions, and new party is start were established in the marginalized areas. Here we have kind of modern political forces. The Communist Party and Islamic Char Charter Front, led by Hassan al-Turabi at that particular time. These two groups had a little influence on the political landscape in the Sudan, but they were very influential among the educated elites. And were, they were at log ahead with the traditional political party. Then they, they made their target to abolish native administration, the system created by the British administration at that time because the, the tribal leader usually, usually supported the traditional parties. They assumed that the abolition of native administration would open the gate for these radical parties to control the political scene. This is a representation of the traditional party in the parliament of 1956. And here we have 65, sorry. And this is the regional parties, southern parties, and radical party. I mean, the uh, uh, Islamic uh, Charter France and the Communist Party. And they secure their seat in parliament through the graduate constituencies. Because when they control the scene and led the revolution against the military regime, they had a chance to change the elect election laws. And they increased the number of graduate constituency from 5 to 15. Then the communists won 11 seats, and the rest won by the Islamic Charter France at that particular time. Then again, the scenario took place in 1968, when the traditional party abolish the graduate constituencies and control the political scene again. 
And this is a situation with reference to, to the election of 1968. DUB controlled the political scene, and the Umar party divided into two, one led by Sadiq al-Mahdi and the other one led by his uncles. And these two parties uh, made a coalition government and continued for one year after the election. And then the military coup came in as a result of conflict between the traditional forces and the outbreak of the southern problem at that time. And if we look at the representation of the southern parties, we would notice that their representation in the political, uh, in the process of decision making was very limited vis-a-vis -vis the, the control or the dominant of the traditional forces in the northern part of the country. Then in 18, in 1986, also the revolution against the military forces was led by the educated elites. And gradually they increased the number of graduate constituents in to, in, 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 from 15 to 28. And this time all the constituency was controlled by Islamic, by Islamic Front, the Islamic National Front led by Dr. Hassan al at that particular time. And this, show, this slide shows the representation of the three major parties, uh, Islamic National Front and the Communist Party, DUP, and uh, Umma Party. And this is the distribution of the, 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 the graduate constituency. And if we notice that all the constituencies, graduate constituency, won, were won by the Islamic National Front at that particular time. Then this is the distribution of the seat inside the parliament. And this is a background of, uh, of democratic election in the Sudan from 1953 up to 1986. And what we can learn from this brief presentation, we can argue that there was a continuous conflict between the two traditional parties, between the Umma and the, the DUP, and between the traditional forces and the radical forces, including the Communist parties and Islamic National Fronts, and on the other hand, between the North and the Southern part of the country. Then here we need to ask a question. Is Sudan's April 2010 national elections a key to unity, maintenance, or recession? To answer this question, we need to highlight the features of the peace of, of the comprehensive peace agreement that was signed in two in 2005 between the government and the National People Liberation Movement led by late John Grant. Here we have the, the president and his deputies and John Grant as well after signing the agreement. What are the features of the agreement? The agreement was based on six protocols. And this protocol shows that the negotiation was a very tough between the two parties and took about two years continuously. And these are the six protocols. The Mashakus Protocol signed in Mashakus in Kenya on 20th July 2002. And, and this protocol deals with the principle of government and governance regarding the, the issue of the state and religion and so on. And the proposal of this protocol was submitted to the negotiators by Danfoss, the representative of the American administration. It means that the two parties, they failed to reach to a certain agreement, and the proposal came from our side, and the American administration enforced the two parties to accept it. The second protocol deals with the issue of power sharing, and, wealth sh and the third with the wealth sharing, and number four, with the resolution of the conflict in Abyei area, one of the richest oil areas in the Sudan. And number four, with 
the security issue, the, 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 the conflict in southern part of Cote d'Ivoire and Blue Nile, whether to be a part of the northern Sudan or to join the southern part of the country, and the protocol number six deals with security issues. All this protocol were compiled in one agreement given the name of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement of 2005. Then we don't have time to discuss all these protocols, but let, have a, let, let us have a look at the protocol of power sharing and to see how it complicated the political scenes and generate a kind of tendency for the Sudanese political elite to move towards the issue of secession. The protocols, the requirement of the protocol include the conduction of national elections in 2009. But the election was delayed as a result of the conflict between the two parties and took place in April 2010. The second issue is a national census in order to revisit the distribution of power and distribution of wealth. And number three is the issue of referendum for the Southerners. If the Southerners are satisfied with the performance of the Khotun government, they would opt to the maintenance of unities. If they are not satisfied, they have the right to determine their futures and to opt for independence. Uh, the agreement created a number of problems, created two systems of governance within the framework of one state. For example, here we have the president, and here we have the president of Southern Sudan. And the president of Southern Sudan has full control over the regions. And the parliament, the judicial institution, and executive institution are answerable to the president of Southern Sudan, not to the president of the federal states. Then here, if you look at the, 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 the electoral system which they produce, it's very complicated. We have three levels. For example, here we have uh, Legislative Council of Northern Sudan. Here we have government, uh, geographical constituencies, party seats, women seats. 64 geographical constituencies, 15 for party seats, 25 for women. And if we move to the lower level, here we have national councils and we have state councils. It means that the agreement created four levels of administration, local government, state government, southern government, and the federal government. And this greatly complicated the political scene in terms of administrations. But this kind of political system came as a result of the conflict between the two parties, the two partners of comprehensive peace agreement when they reached to a deadlock regarding the issue of religion. Then the southerners they asked for a certain degree of autonomy in order to control their regions and separate the north from the rest of the countries. Uh, the, the complicated issue is the issue of power sharing and politics of numbers. What do we mean by politics of numbers? According to the Mashaka's protocol, the national congress parties, uh, the share of power for the national congress party was 52. And for SPLM, 28. If you put 52 together with 28, the total is 80. It means that the rest of political force, they wouldn't be able to change the constitution or to change the term of the agreement. Then at the same time, the, 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 the National Congress Party, in order to secure its position and maintain its control over the process of decision making, he maintained for itself 52. It means that he can run the country without the support of SBLM to a great extent. Then if you put the, sorry, if you put the 
southern party together. This the southern party, this six seat for the, the southern parties and 14 seat for the rest of the northern parties. If you put six together with 28, the total would be 40, 34. Then it means that if the National Congress Party works together with the rest of the Northern Party, also he wouldn't be able to change the constitution and the term of the agreement. Then if we look at this kind of equations and the politics of number, we would argue that if the two parties, the ruling party, NCP and SPLM are in a good term, then they would be able to implement the, the term of the agreement according to their own wish, without any kind of interruption from other parties. But what happened on the ground, there was a conflict between the two ruling parties. And this greatly affected the political atmosphere in Sudan. Then here, if we look at the challenge and the prospects under the terms of comprehensive peace agreement, this is what they achieved without any conflict. The constitution, the electoral law, and the national election commissions, and the electoral constituencies. But the conflict is starting in these areas. Regarding the security laws, the Sudanese census, and the partial participation, and the politics system. The politics system was very complicated, as I, I presented earlier. Then the security law, the government would like to maintain security law in force, and the SPLA would like to remove these laws in order to maintain a certain degree of freedom of speech before the election campaign. The, the, the sharing power and uh, the agreement complicated the situation regarding <coughs> the Sudanese census, because throughout the history of the Sudan, the total population of the northern of the southern part of the country is not more than 20 percent. But according to the term of the agreement, they gave them 34 percent. For this reason, they rejected the result of the election, the, 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 the national census. This greatly complicated the political scene between the two parties. And here, this is uh, this what I talk about. For example. In the north, you should have eight pallets, and in, in, the, in the south, in the south should be twelve, because you would add the the the, the southern the, 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 the legislative council in the southern half of the country. Then this would be if you add one plus three plus one plus one and plus six. Here it would be twelve. It means that when you go to the pallet to vote, you should have. 12 politics for the president, for the, the president of the southern Sudan, for the, the, the governor of the state, for the geographical constituency, for the women seat, for uh, for the party seats, and this would include national would include uh, legislative council of the south and national council or national assembly and state councils. Then let us move to highlight the problems. This is the distribution of the seats according to the country. Here, for, for, for geographical constituency, we have 270. For uh, path list, we have 68. And for women list, we have 112. This together would form the National Assembly for the administration of the country. Uh, a number of problems and challenges took place during that time. If we look at the implementation of comprehensive peace agreement. The national sentence, sentence should take place in July 2007, but as a result of the conflict between the two parties, was delayed for one year. Then national electoral law was delayed for two years as a result of the conflict between the two parties, and also the national election commission, the appointment of the, the member of the national election commission was delayed for two years and the election itself was delayed for one year. All these issues reflect the degree of tension that took place between the two partners of the comprehensive peace agreement and paved the way for the ground to talk about the secession. 
then if we look at the result of 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 uh, the sentence, it increase the the, the the seat or the representation of the National Congress Party in, in the National Assembly to 79% or the Northern Party to 79% in the state of 60 something and reduce the number of the Southern parties to 20%. This creates a real problem and challenges between the two government and regarding the result of uh, the outcome of the national census was rejected by the southerners due to this figure. Because I assume that the number in the southern part of the country is more than 8 million and in the northern part of the country also the representation of the southerner is higher than the figure given by national census. Then a number of questions were raised before the elections. A number of questions were raised during the electoral campaigns and the, the doing of the declaration of the result of the election. Will opposition party in historical marginalized regions like Darfur and Eastern Sudan win some legislative seats, giving them a voice on national, deci on, on national decisions? And will the SPL SPLM win enough seats to block the NCB's ability to pass legislations or amount the constitution? How will the allocation of seats in the National Assembly change from what it was under the interim constitutions? <coughs> These key questions were raised before the elections, but the result of the elections gives us different answers. And let us look at the result. This when also when the American asked the government, is everything ready for the next election? As Professor Mustafa Kamal mentioned in the present reply, everything is ready, even the results. <laughs> <laughs> and this would indicate the situation and the degree of fairness and freedom regarding the conduction of the election in the Sudan. I'm not going to talk about that. I think the issue has thoroughly been covered by Professor Mustafa regarding the experience of our neighbor, the Egyptians. This is the outcome of the presidential elections. The president, Omar al-Bashir, got 68% uh, and the second candidate, Yasser Armano, Sudan People's Liberation Movement, even he caught in the north, but in the south, got two million. And equivalent to 21%. The President al-Bashir in the southern part of the country got less than 2%. It means that the southerners were less interested in his leadership. And due to this fact, they supported their candidate, Yasser Arman, even Yasser Arman, even the SPLM boycott the election in the northern part of the country and withdraw from the electoral race. The rest of the leader of the political party boycotted, except a few, the independents only, Sadiq al Mahdi boycotted, then Mubarak al Fadl al Mahdi, the, the other section of the Ummah party boycotted, but the representative of Democratic Unionist Party under the leadership of Al Mirpani joined the election. The, the representative of Hassan al Turabi, the popular Congress party, also joined the election, and their score was very low. The, but if we put this, the, 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 the result in the wider context of those who registered for the elections, 16 million registered for the elections. But due to boycott of the election by the major party, 9 million didn't cast their votes. It means that if we put Al-Bashir in the number of those registered for the elections, he got less than 43. But if we look at his percentage with reference to those who voted, it is 68. At the level of the legislative assembly, the NCP 
plot 72. SPLM plot 22. In the northern part of the country. The southern oppositions and the north got only 7%. It means that the election, the result of the election, it wouldn't change the political discourse in favor of the opposition, but it, it, it would strengthen the grip of the political ruling party in the north and the SPLM in the south. The very interesting thing is the result this is a result in the National Assembly seats and distribution in the South. If you look at the South, also the South was fully controlled by SPLM. The rest of the Southern Party, the representation was very limited, and also one, one seat was six, two seats were, were controlled by NPC. Then it means that the, 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 if we talk about the unity of the country, it would be very far rich under such kind of political situations. We have a number of marginalized regions, such as the case of Darfur, and we assume that the, the, the voters in Darfur wouldn't support the government. But the outcome, the result of the elections, proves the opposite. The NCB controlled more than 87% of the seats in, 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 in Darfur, and 83 in Northern Darfur, and 90 in Southern Darfur. For this reason, the leader of the opposition tried to create a certain degree of doubt about the accuracy and, uh, and fairness of the election result. And they tried to talk about the rigging of the result and changing of the bullet boxes and so on. This is a situation in the northern part of the country. The southern part of the country. The southern part of the country controlled by SPLM, except the area of Blue, Blue Nile. This one of the area of disputed area between the government and the and, and the southern uh, and, and, and the government of the south. Then, the outcome of the elections and the political discourse took place in the Sudan after the endorsement of the comprehensive peace agreement, would it lead us to the unity maintenance of recessions? I would argue that the current political situation would lead to secessions due to a number of factors. The first factor associated by the challenges created by comprehensive peace agreement, like the system of governance and distribution of power and so on. The implementations create another problem. Number one, the conflict inside NCB because some influential member of NCB were against the outcome of the comprehensive agreement. And from day one, they start to criticize the agreement and create a series of obstacles for the implementation of the agreement. Then again, the conflict between the partners of CBA mainly the, 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 ruling, the two ruling parties, uh, the SPLM and the National Congress Party. The whole scenarios resulted in a certain degree of mistrust between the North and the South, and this automatically would lead to secession of the countries. But the question here we need to raise, what would be the consequences if the secessions took place? would affect the north, or would affect the south, or would affect the two parts of the country, and would have regional impact on the neighboring countries. This is what we are going to see in the remaining part of my presentations. Uh, yes, I came back from Sudan uh, three days ago, and registrations of voters in the southern part of the country about 3 million, and in the north about 91,000. Uh, 91, Why the registration is very low in the northern part of the country? Because this would affect the status of the southerners who live in the northern part of the country. If they register, and the decision of the majority was the secessions, 
they should leave the North South Africa. They wouldn't maintain their, 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 their the same status. Either they should apply in order to get uh, nationalities or to get a passport or such kind of things. Because they, they fought for secession. Then they should leave the northern part of the country to, to the south. Again, if the majority of them who live in the northern part of the countries fought for the unities, and the majority was in favor of the recession, also they would face the same problems. Then in the northern part of the country, the vast majority of the Sassanas boycott registrations in order to maintain their, 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 their current status as a citizen of the northern part of the Sudan, even they are Sassanas. And you see how the situation is very, very complicated. Uh, the, the area of tensions, Sorry, put succession here, but it should be secessions. Abiyay area. According to the decision of Lahai Court, International Court in Lahai, Abiyay as a city was put in the northern border. But 50% of the land of the nomadic tribe lived in the northern part of the country was put in the southern part of the country. Then the indigenous population of this area, even if the secession took place, they wouldn't accept the decision of the International Court of Justice in Lahai. This would be one of the fourth area that would create tension between the northern part and the southern part of the country if secession took place. The other area of tension here, we have a number of nomadic tribes live in the border area, and they would like to move between the north and the south. In the area in the tribe of southern Darfur and Denka Malwan, Hawazma and Denka Barek, area of Khor Yabus in Upper Nile, tribe of south, southern Blue Nile, and southern tribes of Upper Nile. They would like to maintain their move during winter time and summer. Then if the country was separated into two parties, then the move of this pastoralistic tribe would, would be difficult and would create another tension of conflict between the north and southern part of the countries. Uh, Eastern Sudan, Darfur crisis, southern Darfur. This also area of tension. It means that the secession of the country or the secession of the south from the rest of the Sudan would increase the tension in Darfur because it would raise the ceiling of the demand of the Darfurian, and the southern part of the country will be a refuge for the Darfurian rebellions, and would complicate the situation in the north. Here in this area also, they have the popular consultations. After the secession, the citizens of this part of the Sudan, they should either join the north or join the southern part of the country. This again would complicate the political situation, and the other issue, the status of the southern minority live in the north and southern and, and, and northern minority live in the south. Whether they should leave the country and join one part of the country or to maintain their status as it is. In northern Sudan, all the, the headquarters of the southern university we have it in Khartoum then how we are going to transfer it, how we are going to distribute or distribute the state assets between the two countries. This would be another area of tension. If we look at the southern part of the country as unit, we wouldn't argue that the southern part of the country is a homogeneous, is a very heterogeneous. They have many ethnic groups, they speak more than 50 languages, and the Arabic languages is the language franca between all these ethnic groups. Then the dominant tribes are the Dinka, but the rest wouldn't accept the leadership of the Dinka. Does this mean that the, rest, the, the small tribes would break away from northern, uh, southern Sudan also and establish their own countries? And the situation is very gloomy and is very complicated. The issue of the oil, 
from the total production of the oil in the southern part of the country, the Khotun government get, get 50 percent, and the southern uh, and, uh, and the government of the south gets 50 percent, divided 50-50. Then, uh, in terms of production, 70 percent of the oil production comes from the south, and 30 percent come from the north. 59 percent of the budget of the, of, of the government of the South comes from the oil revenues. And 44 percent for the federal government come from the oil revenues. Meaning that if the secession took place between the two countries and it was not a smooth one, then definitely would create a very devastated situation in the southern part of the country as well as in the northern part of the countries. The issue of tensions a pipeline. If we had any smooth sep separations, then the pipeline should go should, should go through the northern part of the country to Port Sudan. Then if they will, if there is a kind of conflict, this is very costly for the southerners to create a pipeline down to Lamu in Kenya. And the situation for the north, for the southern part of the country is a little bit complicated compared with the situation of the north in terms of oil production and exportation of the oil. And the issue of the distribution of Nile waters. Sudan, in its current positions, had eight neighbors countries, including Egypt in the north, Libya, and here we have Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Central Africa, Congo, and Chad. Then, when it comes to the issue of distribution of water, this is a very vital topic for the Egyptians. Because Egypt is usually described as a gift of the Nile. Then if the country of the Nile Valley would like to change the agreement of 1929, this would create a great problem for the Egyptians. Because the Egyptians uh, usually get about 48 uh, million cubic meters of water, and the Sudan gets only four. The rest of the Nile Valley, they would like to get their share. And 82% of the Nile waters come from Ethiopia and Eritrea. 18% come from the White Nile, from uh, Victoria Lakes and Alberta Lakes in, in, in the south. The other challenge would come from the external the, the international and regional political forces who are interested in the oil. We have the Egyptians, the, the Indians, the, the American, and the Japanese and Chinese and the others. What will be the status of the Chinese investors in Sudan, the Malaysians and the others? Would they support the national government or would, would, would join the no, northern government or would join the south the southern government. And this definitely would affect the term of the agreement with the federal government in Khotun. And the very interesting thing, during the war time, the Chinese support Jordan and support the government in Khotun in order to secure their oil area in, in the countries. Uh, if, if the conflict took place, this will be the result in Sudan. And for this reason, I feel that the picture is very gloomy, and nobody in Khartoum and in Juba nowadays knows about the consequences of what will be the consequences of the recession of the Sudan. And even American administration talks about the conduction of the referendum at the, the, the fixed date, but they don't talk about the consequences of the secession of the Sudan. The secession of the Sudan would affect many areas, uh, of the south would affect many areas, would affect Darfur, would affect the Abiyai region, the Nuba Mountain, uh, 
in the Nuba Mountain in these two areas and the eastern Sudan. It means that the, the secessions might lead to the state ending in the Sudan or the dismantling of the, 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 the historical country of the Sudan. This is my presentation and thank you very much. Extraordinary. I told you it was complicated, and uh, now you can see, but I think we've had about as clear an exposition as you could imagine uh, of, of the multitudinous factors that seem to be uh, shaping a, a situation that we don't know consequences of. But it doesn't sound like that will be very good from uh, what Professor Abershoff was saying. Um, let's uh, take a moment to stretch our legs uh, again, but not too long. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back and I will uh, ask the floor to be open for your comments and questions on both the Egyptian uh, issue and the Sudanese issue. So we'll take a two minute break. Who uh, has been very uh, attentive and patient in sitting through some extremely uh, intricate, complicated, uh, and rather pessimistic material. Uh, we will, uh, as we always do here, uh, open up the uh, floor for your comments and questions. Uh, <coughs> and I don't think I'll try to segregate these into the sort of the Egyptian part or the Sudanese part. We'll just, I think we'll just let it flow. Uh, and, uh, I will ask you, though, if you would uh, just briefly identify yourself and if you would make your comment or question uh, as brief as possible so that others can have the chance and so that our speakers can uh, respond. Uh, and depending on the flow of questions, I'll either take them one at a time, or if we have a great many, I may take two or three questions and then, and then pitch them to the speakers. So uh, uh, with, with that, uh, the floor is open for uh, comments and questions. Yes, please. For, um, I forgot your name, but the Egyptian expert. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Samir Nazir. I'm with the mechanical. Oh, sorry. Uh, with the mechanical engineering faculty. For Professor Mustafa Kamal Al Sayed, um, who is your audience for your work within Egypt, and has the government commented or interacted with you in any way? I, um, my academic um, work is published um, outside of Egypt, but I write also in Arabic, and um, I publish regularly in uh, one independent newspaper. I publish an article uh, once every two weeks, and um, so and I'm often also interviewed on the TV. Uh, so I address the general public in Egypt. I address academics. And I am a member of um, several human rights organizations, and they, you know, organize activities. So I talk to the people. So, but, and I, I have no problem. I have no problem. Um, uh, my, um, I used to be on good terms with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I think on a number of occasions, you know, I was sent to uh, represent uh, Egypt uh, in um, uh, informal. Um, international uh, gatherings. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. I used to be in good terms also with some ministers, <coughs> but not with the Minister of um, Interior, who is in charge of uh, internal security, and because uh, a number of ministers in Egypt are themselves uh, former university professors. Uh, and I'm not the only one who speaks like this in Egypt. Uh, I try to express myself in a sort of objective, moderate, scientific language. But some of my colleagues, you know, um, do not um, limit themselves by the academic uh, language. Uh, so we have um, a degree of freedom of expression in the country. But I think it is, um, so far, um, uh, I think it has been effective in um, raising the level of political awareness among the people and in getting several uh, civil society movements to come up. So there is a number of civil society movements uh, which are calling 
for political change in the country. And despite attempts by the government to limit the freedom of speech, this has not been uh, quite successful. And you'll find you know, people saying the same thing on pages of newspapers which are published uh, you know, uh, daily with no problem. So this is, I think, one of the um, uh, unique features of the Egyptian situation. It's on the one hand, you have this degree of freedom of expression, and at uh, the same time, uh, you have also these practices uh, by the government. And you know, I think this cannot continue for a long time. <laughs> and the government started to tighten political control, and I think the outcome of election shows you know, this wish to tighten political control. But I guess also there are people within the government who feel that you know, um, 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 the method uh, of control that was used in the last election was not very wise. Uh, it would have been safer to allow the opposition a larger number of seats and the, the larger possibility to express uh, views. Uh, uh, but I think you know this coexistence of um, you know a good degree of freedom of expression and at the same time also you know uh, this kind of practice by the government cannot continue for a long time. So <laughs> it will be resolved one way or the other, uh, either you know further tightening of uh, political control or you know a more profound opening of the political system. Could I follow up on that though and ask you about the case of our uh, colleague Saad Din Ibrahim? who uh, became very well known in the United States, at least for his opposition, and who had a great deal of trouble with the Egyptian government. Um, yeah. Saad, I think, um, um, was not wise enough, uh, because so far I did not, uh, uh, I, I think, um, people who are critical of the government do not call for foreign uh, interference, no call for the United States to come to Egypt and, you know, uh, exert pressure on the Egyptian government to change uh, its uh, methods. And Saad, I think, you know, would go further. I think he would, you know, support the U.S. government in uh, pressuring the Egyptian government. And this uh, was not well seen by the uh, Egyptians. And I think also on one occasion he made fun of the president, uh, you know, during the funeral of the um, of Hafez al-Assad, the late president of Syria, uh, he was asked by Al Jazeera to comment on the funeral. And uh, during, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, program, he was asked by a colleague, a political science colleague, who uh, put the question to Saad al Ibrahim, uh, what happened in Syria? Could it be repeated in Egypt? And Saad, you know, likes to make, you know, jokes. So he said, well, you know, um, people would come to President Hosni Mubarak and would ask him to uh, uh, give up the presidency for his son. And in the beginning, he would resist and would resist and would resist and finally he would accept. And then he said for Al Jazeera, with millions of people watching, I think that was a big mistake on the part of Saad. So it became, you know, his opposition became personal opposition. And I think after that, you know, a number of cases brought against him, were brought against him, and he spent, you know, months in uh, prison. So um, I think uh, Saad went too far uh, in his opposition to the prison by calling uh, on foreign governments to uh, intervene. Uh, so I think this is the reason he had the trouble. But at the end also he did something, you know, I think quite foolish because he accepted to sign, in fact, for the son of the prince. So he built his reputation on his opposition to family succession in Egypt. But, you know, I don't know whether you know about this, you know, just a few months ago, you know, he signed, you know, a statement supporting the son of the president to succeed his father. And so he discredited himself before the Egyptian public, and he described himself also before foreign governments who used to think of him as champion of democracy in, in Egypt. So I think he has no problem now with the, uh, uh, to go back to the country, because I mean, he's, he has been dis discredited. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, please. I have two questions for you. You noted that there was 80% um, of, of the 
politicians that campaign have no political experience um, or affiliation or even an agenda. Um, what kind of dangers do you perceive? And you also know that there are people among the rich elite. What kind of dangers do you perceive out of such um, suddenly coming into government? And my second question, um, with such a dramatic outcome of no brotherhood in the government, um, what kind of fears does the government have on the public level to outcome from such a from no percentage of the representation? Um, yeah, the danger, um, yeah, um, uh, it is a good thing that, you know, ordinary people would like to run for, you know, public office, would like to be elected as deputies. Uh, however, with those people having no background, I think uh, no political background, um, I think they would use, uh, this is what happened in fact, uh, they would use public post for private uh, uh, purposes. Uh, and uh, So, we have cases uh, of deputies who would get from the government, uh, I think, the um, authorization uh, to send people to receive medical treatment abroad. Uh, and they are paid for this. You know, the government would give them money to uh, allow people to go and they, they would use this, you know, for uh, but they would uh, pretend that they, these, um, uh, the money they are getting is to help people uh, go for treatment abroad. But then they, you know, they would get the money for themselves. Uh, or you know, they have also the right to, uh, not everyone can go for pilgrimage in Egypt because Saudi Arabia limits the number of uh, pilgrims uh, going to the country you know, because it does not like you know, too many people to go. Uh, so uh, the uh, members of the People's Assembly get the right uh, to give people authorization to go for pilgrimage uh, in Saudi Arabia. So in principle, they should, you know, uh, they should give this to people uh, free of charge, uh, but then they would ask people to pay for them so that they can give them you know, this uh, permission. Uh, so uh, those people, and also they would use you know, the, their um, access to ministers uh, uh, in order to get you know, private benefits uh, for themselves. Uh, so this one thing. The other thing is that um, uh, yeah, they would uh, tend to, they know that they won because of government um, at least acquiescence. Uh, so for them to continue to be members, uh, they have to continue to support the government. Uh, so in fact, this weakens the cause of uh, democracy in, in the long term. Uh, your other question, yeah, the uh, low turnout rate, uh, uh, of course, this in itself, is a sign of lack of legitimacy uh, of the government. Uh, because particularly um, areas which are inhabited uh, by uh, middle class educated people uh, uh, show a very low turnout rate. Uh, so this is, you know, usually the turnout rate is lower in major urban areas. And we expect, you know, people with higher level of education, higher level of income uh, to be living in uh, uh, major urban areas. Uh, you know, I teach at the American University in Cairo, and I ask my students uh, to, you know, ask members of their families uh, who, uh, how many of them went to vote. Uh, and uh, students at the American University in Cairo come usually from uh, upper middle class. Uh, so when, you know, after the election, when I ask them, you know, do you know members of your family who went to vote? You know, their answer was that they did not know any member of their family who went to vote. Uh, so. You know, uh, so the fact that you know politically aware Egyptians don't go to vote uh, uh, suggests that you know the government has a problem with those people. Uh, and I did not go to vote myself. You know, I would like to observe, uh, but I don't go to vote uh, because you know I feel that you know um, the election is not fair. Uh, so why should I go to vote? And I think this, so. Um, there is you know this schism, this you know gap of credibility on the part of the government and highly educated people. So in the long term, I think the lack of legitimacy, even though when people do not demonstrate, do not go out, uh, but uh, the lack of uh, legitimacy means that you know anything can happen. Anything can happen. Uh, you know, if uh, some people are trying to uh, overthrow the government, then they would have the support of those who uh, do not uh, participate. Uh, Dr. Yes. Rahman. Uh, I'm Ataula. I'm Middle East Institute. First of all, I think uh, it's an excellent presentation uh, as far as it uh, election thing goes you know and, uh, but uh, you I I didn't get uh, from your presentation 
the main drivers of change in Egyptian politics. It's not only the election that changes, uh, because the power base is not, uh, as you said very clearly, uh, is within the people or within the reach of the people. It's elsewhere. So, uh, how would you foresee the future change? When the people fail to change the government, so what are the uh, main drivers of change will uh, be in the future uh, to uh, you know, shape the new Egypt? Uh, yeah, but I said that you know I don't like to engage in you know long-term forecasting. But for the short term, definitely this uh, you know, regime is going to continue. Um, in the long term, of course, much will depend on the level of education of people. But I don't see you know popular revolt. I don't see popular revolt in the country. But I think there is a certain you know sense of rationality in the Egyptian system. I think. Uh, I refer to um, unprecedented level uh, of protest action by people who uh, are complaining of deteriorating conditions of living uh, and also the proliferation of political protest uh, movements. Uh. So I think when these movements coalesce, uh, this might not lead to a popular revolt, but I think it would you know, uh, get you know, some people within the government uh, to think of um, you know, more profound uh, reform. So I don't see, you know, if you look at it in terms of state-society relations, I think this change which is taking place within society would produce change in the state by, you know, and I think also one of the hopeful signs is that the businessmen have started also to be critical of this method of ruling them. And, you know, I um, had a, there was, this was not, you know, something, you know, I'm speculating on, but there was a TV talk show which brought uh, some of the wealthiest uh, businessmen in the country. Uh, one of them is well known because you know he's, uh, he runs a multinational enterprise. Uh, um, his name is Nagib Sawiris. He has this mobile firm, uh, which has you know uh, cell phone companies. Uh, I don't know in Canada, in Italy, in Holland, etc. Um, together with some other business people, and all of them said, "Well, we support the National Democratic Party, but we would like to see uh, free and fair elections in Egypt." Uh, and we would like al Baradi to run as a candidate. We may not give him our vote, but we would like to see an open uh, uh, political process in the country. So uh, the fact that you know businessmen, uh, you know, are distancing themselves uh, from the policies of the government uh, means that you know uh, even at this level, and those are people who have the capacity to influence uh, the process of change in the country. So uh, I think you know this, you know. Um, uh, the continuation uh, of political reform uh, movements and of protest actions also would, you know, uh, persuade, you know, some people within the state, uh, you know, um, I don't know, within the armed forces, uh, within the administration, that, you know, it is time to, you know, respond to this by uh, introducing more uh, profound uh, change. Uh, so I think this is, but, you know, when will this happen, uh, you know, I, I, I cannot say. Yes, uh, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, Saadeddin Talib uh, from Yemen, which uh, I might add uh, that it suffers both uh, succession and secession problems. Uh, uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Abu Shok uh, regarding the secession of the South or the possibility that may happen. And uh, another small question for Professor Mustafa. Uh, uh, South Sudan, the southern part of Sudan, is, is landlocked. And, and oil that was discovered, which probably is the main cause of, of ambition of secession, is actually on the border. And uh, as I know, uh, you just told me that the, the pipeline actually runs to the north. And uh, I see that as a very strong link uh, on dependence of, uh, of the south of Sudan to this pipeline which goes in the north. That's one thing. Is, it, uh, is, that, is that true? I mean, how, how much of, a, uh, of an impact will that have? Uh, the second thing is uh, the south government, or there has already been some sort of a self-government over the last few years. Has the government been successful in, in 
in this governance issue uh, uh, in delivering service to the people of the South so that uh, we will know what kind of a country or do they have an uh, aspiration of what kind of country that will become later or is it going to be just another uh, devastated, failed, uh, poor state? Uh, and, and perhaps there is a lack of actual education of the public about the possibility of actually building, building a strong state like uh, in the Sudan. Um, these are the questions of, uh, uh, with Professor Abusho. Uh, when it comes to Egypt, actually, uh, I was educated in Egypt, and I've always been hopeful that the pull for democracy in the Middle East would come from Egypt. And uh, we were very hopeful in Yemen uh, over the last, uh, but now it's just like all the, it, it makes me lose faith that to build democracy bit by bit uh, over 20 years is really a hopeless effect. I like the picture behind you, uh, which says thank you on a beach. It just reminds me of building democracy on sand. And then suddenly a big wave comes and takes away, uh, and takes away everything. <laughs> so uh, I'm just thinking about that. Uh, it, it is. I, I don't see the West or, or the international powers are very influential with the governments of the Middle East. I know they are with our government. In fact, they're even allowed to bomb people, uh, which that's okay. So uh, I don't know that will ever come to Egypt, but uh, if necessary for the for the continuation of the regimes, uh, they may, might be allowed. So yes, they have the, the foreign powers do have pressure uh, ability on, on on regimes uh, in the Middle East to, but probably not to democratize, as you said. Now I'm losing faith even in that that there is any pressure at all for democratization process. So uh, these are my, my thoughts. Uh, and the question, the small one is, is there a nominee now for the National Party for the next year presidential elections? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Saladin Abtali, for these uh, remarks and observations. Yes, I do agree with you. The pipeline should be one of the factors that we encourage for all the Southerners to maintain the unity of the Sudan. But at the same time, the Southerners look at the issue from, the, the separatists look at the issue from different perspectives. They argue that since they have uh, a, a large quantity of oil in the southern part of the Sudan, why do they share it with the northern part of the country? Should, they should maintain this 100% of the oil for the utilization in the southern part of the country instead of sharing with the northern part of the country. On the other hand, the unionists among the southerners, they argue that it would be very difficult to maintain the viabilities of our country in the north, in the southern part of the Sudan because the, the, north, the southern part of the Sudan is blocked. And if they would like to export the oil, it would be a problem for them. Therefore, either to maintain uh, this unity with, with the Sudan or look for a, a kind of a confederation system which they didn't include in, in, the, in the comprehensive peace agreement. And this will be the third alternative. But the problem here is that whether the government would accept this proposal or not uh, regarding the issue of, 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 of pipeline. Uh, the issue of the success of the government in the southern part of the country when John Garan was alive, he always talks about uh, New Sudan. And he assumed that he would establish a kind of democratic system and build the infrastructures and the civil society and so on. But the experience of the current regime after the death of John Garan, it, it is full of failures because they failed to build the infrastructures, they failed to democratize the southern, the north, the southern part of the country. And their continuation in power will be a kind of another failure in, 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 in the southern part of the country, and it might lead to the division in the house itself, because this, the current regime is totally dominated by the Dake, one of the well-educated tribe in, in, the, in the southern part of, of the country, and the rest of the minor, the, the, 
Junior tried to accept the leadership of the day it might create another scenario of conflict in the southern part of Japan. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree with you that um, you know there is there is no uh, Western pressure on the government of Egypt to uh, take the issue of the war seriously. And I think um, in diplomatic uh, uh, practices, you know, a statement uh, would be um, uh, taken seriously uh, if it comes from the highest authority of the government. So if the criticism of Egypt came from President Obama, uh, would be taken seriously. If it comes from Mrs. Hillary Clinton, would be taken seriously. But to come, not even from the White House, but from someone in the National Security Council, <coughs> and to come in the State Department from you know, the spokesman of the uh, State Department. I think this would not be taken seriously. But you know, the Egyptian government responded and said that you know the uh, U.S. government and uh, the uh, uh, and the European Union are acting on the basis of inaccurate information. They are not well informed. They listen to people who are hostile to the interests of Egypt, something like that. So, you know, I don't think this, uh, you know, kind of statement is effective at all. And as I said, uh, because you know, there is, you know, I think unjustified uh, uh, fear that you know, if the Islamists come to power, then you know, Egypt's relations with the Western countries will deteriorate. And I think the example of Turkey, which is ruled in fact by an Islamist party, you know, if you meet the leaders of the Justice and uh, Development Party in Turkey, they are Islamists. And there is no doubt about it. Nevertheless, you know, Turkey maintains you know, very good relations with the US and with the European uh, Union. Uh, but on the question of a nominee of the NDP, this is again an intriguing question because the latest statements is that uh, President Mubarak would be the official candidate of the National Democratic Party if he so wishes. So the important thing is that if he so wishes, uh, that's why you know some people uh, are uh, you know trying to prepare the ground uh, for his succession by his son, uh, and uh, in fact um, uh, the. Uh, interesting thing about uh, these elections uh, is that the one who led the efforts of the ruling party to win that massive year is again a very important uh, businessman uh, who is the secretary of organization uh, within the National Democratic Party and he's very close to Gamal Mubarak, uh, to the son of the president. Uh, so uh, even, you know, uh, I think the um, thinking uh, of the people who support the son of the president uh, is that even if the president runs, he would not be able to complete, you know, six terms in office. He's 82 years old, uh, so they don't expect him to, you know, I don't know, to survive until he becomes, you know, 88 years. So either he, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, disappears uh, involuntarily, or you know, he decides uh, not to complete his term in office. Then they should be ready. You know, to push the candidacy of his uh, son. So uh, I think this is the present uh, situation. So it is again, you know, dependent on the will of the president uh, to run for, I think, would be fifth term. Okay, follow up on that. Uh, yes, please. Yes, Shahid Ali from RSIS. I was wondering whether, you know, you were mentioning a possibility of popular dissatisfaction and yeah. so on within parties. Is there any possibility of this popular dissatisfaction creeping into the situations which are now supporting the uh, regime, the military, the security services? Is there any possibility that younger generation in the military, for instance, would become also dissatisfied or join the, uh, the younger generation outside in protesting against the regime? Yeah, this is you know a difficult question because. Uh, you know, Egypt is not a country where one can go and, you know, ask the military people, you know, do you like the president, do you like the policies? Uh, but uh, uh, now there is, you know, some feeling uh, that the military in Egypt are not happy about the privatization policies. Uh, and, you know, some reports were published about, you know, um, uh, the Minister of Defense uh, in a meeting of the Council of Ministers, 
criticizing the ministers who are in favor of privatization because you know some uh, factors which are seen as of uh, strategic interests were solved. Um, uh, one factory, I think, which uh, was capable of producing heavy water. Uh, so it was reported in newspapers that you know a senior minister criticized the privatization policy in a meeting of the cabinet. Also, I think the military, you know, are perceived to be jealous of the mounting influence of businessmen. Uh, so, you know, this uh, might suggest that, you know, the um, military are not in favor of uh, succession by the son of Mubarak because they feel that he's, you know, um, uh, surrounded uh, by a group of businessmen who are trying also to make profit uh, out of their monopoly situation. This is, you know, the person that I talked about, you know, has uh, almost 60% of the market for steel in the country. And immediately after the election, uh, his, he raised the price of steel by 200 pounds, you know, immediately after the election. And that was interpreted as a way of compensating for what he paid for the success immediately after the election. And this is, you know, not a secret. I mean, this came in uh, newspapers. Uh, so I think there is a certain perception that the military are not happy with the mounting influence of this group of uh, businessmen. So for this reason, they might not be in favor of uh, family succession. Uh, yeah, but this is, you know, again, a matter of speculation. Uh, uh, yes, please. Um, Rana Khoury, Middle East Institute. Um, I know that we're, we're running short on time, but if I may, I would like to sort of ask both of you about the relationship between Egypt and Sudan, which has had a very um, intimate history, um, albeit unbalanced in terms of power relations um, within it, and sort of the implications of a Sudanese uh, southern secession for that relationship. I know that Egypt has, takes a very strong stance against the secession, um, and they would like to maintain what I would call sort of a hegemonic um, position over Sudan. And what are the implications for the two to five million uh, Sudanese refugees that currently reside in Egypt? I know that the Egyptian government doesn't call them refugees for political reasons. That's why it's two to five million. It's a hard number to pin down. But what are the implications for those people-to-people -people relations and the government and power relations? Uh, uh, actually, when we look at uh, the current political scenario in Sudan vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, a response to the Egyptian government need to address this issue from a historical perspective. Because since the process of the negotiation started in Russia and other uh, cities in Kenya, the role of the Arab countries was totally excluded. And the Egyptians tried to, 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 to criticize this kind of scenarios because the Egyptians have uh, great interest in the Sudan <coughs> And, and a kind of reciprocal interest between Egypt and the Sudanese government. And the Egyptians from the very beginning have their reservation regarding the, the, the outcome of the agreement. Number one, they were against the establishment of two system of governance in Sudan because they assumed that at the end, the establishment of two systems would lead to the recession, secession of the countries. On the other hand, they uh, criticized the stand of uh, the National Congress Party when they made the religion as a major issue in the negotiation because they assumed that the issue of the Sharia was one of the issues that complicated the, uh, the, the political discourse in the Sudan and it has its repercussion as well. Uh, when it comes to the economic interest of Egypt, uh, <coughs> the Egyptian wouldn't be in favor of the secessions because this would greatly affect the issue of the distribution of Nile water and would open the gate for the southern government to make a new alliance with the country of the Nile Valley and change the long history agreement of the Nile distribution of 
1929. And uh, definitely the change of, of, of this equation would affect the, 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 the interest of the Egyptian in the Nile water. Then the Egyptian would be against the recession. As a result of that, in order to avoid this tension, the Egyptian, I think, they, 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 they hold the stick from the middle. They try to negotiate at the same time with the, with the southern with the southern elite and the, at the same time with the northern. In order to avoid this kind of critical situation, they propose the idea of the establishment of a confederation be, between the north and the south, since the two parties uh, didn't agree about the terms of the agreement of the comprehensive peace agreement. This, on the one hand, on the other hand. The Egyptian government wouldn't be happy about the, 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 secession, the secession for political reasons because the northern part will be heavily dominated by an Islamic oriented government. And the Islamization of the state and the society in this sense, according to the agenda of the current ruling parties, would affect the political discourse in Egypt. And, and give a hope for the Muslim brothers who to push harder in order to to contribute to the process of decision making. And definitely this wouldn't be in favor of the current Egyptian region. Yeah, I agree uh, with this um, analysis. Uh, I would like just to add, you know, how the Egyptian government is reacting. Uh, uh, as you know, the Egyptian government felt that, you know, um, I don't know, secession, uh, is on the way. Uh, um, he tried to establish relations uh, with people of the south. Uh, so John Garang was invited to Cairo and he met senior Egyptian officials. Uh, and uh, the Egyptian government is trying to carry out development projects in the south. So he's taking now the position that, you know, secession is coming and it would be good to maintain you know, cordial relations uh, with the two uh, Parts of uh, Sudan. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard you know anything about the Sudanese who are living in Egypt. I mean, no one suggested that you know any uh, that they should be penalized for the uh, secession in Sudan. And I guess also, if the approach is to maintain good relations with Sudan, uh, then the Sudanese who are living in Egypt uh, should uh, live there. What happened to people of uh, southern Sudan who were I don't know harshly uh, forced to leave uh, uh, one place in uh, uh, central Cairo. I think this you know, deviates from the general approach of the Egyptian uh, government. Uh, but you know, a large number of Sudanese you know, came to Egypt. And in fact, they don't want to stay in Egypt, but wanted to go to uh, Europe, European countries. And they um, were protesting against uh, the office of the high Commission for Refugees in Egypt because it was not giving them uh, documents so that they can travel. And they, you know, um, used to occupy a certain place in a middle class district in Cairo and, you know, for a long time. <laughs> so when well, Egyptian government is not uh, kind, if Egyptians try to do this. So if it is not kind with the Egyptians, it is not kind also with, you know, Sudanese who are trying to occupy this place. So that was, you know, condemned by many people in Egypt. So that was, you know, in fact, a tragic, you know, um, uh, uh, event in the history of uh, Egyptian-Sudanese relations. But so far as the large number of Sudanese who are living in Egypt, uh, so far as their, you know, presence in the country is concerned, I haven't heard anything suggesting that the Egyptian government would do anything um, uh, against uh, them. Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, we've run a bit over time, uh, but I think uh, it's been an extremely rewarding afternoon. Uh, again, on behalf of MEI, I'd like to thank our two excellent speakers for their uh, superb presentations and uh, the audience for uh, uh, helping us with, I think, uh, some very good uh, comments and questions. So, uh, uh, with uh, thanks to you all. I think